Uh, so without any further ado, um, I've had the pleasure to know Scott Morris for, I don't know, three years or so. He's um, uh, been working on the U.S. Uh, TAG, which is the U.S. Technical Advisory Group, to ISO PC251, which is the group that's been um, the U.S. committee that's been one of 28 countries that's been writing the ISO 55000 uh, series of standards that Reese talked about uh, in, the, in the very first session. And Scott's been a key member of the U.S. delegation. He was also the uh, convener, a technical term for the person who led um, ISO 17021-5, uh, which is the standard that sets audit and certification requirements against ISO 55000. And he's also leading an asset management um, journey for his own corporation. So without any further ado, uh, big hand, please, and welcome Scott Morris, please. Thank you and good morning. Um, thanks for showing up. I mean, it's a, a pretty big room, um, and you're all here to see Reese and David, and I'm just the filler in between. So thank you. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, as Terry said, uh, I was the vice chair for the US TAG convener 17021-5. Um, background, eight years in nuclear power and 22 years now in the pharmaceutical industry. So the reason I got involved with ISO 55000, uh, you'll see, uh, but it's my belief that as time goes on, regulators are going to start using this standard to regulate industry. And since we're in a regulated industry, um, we're going to get caught up in that. But also, as we've gone through the development, I also believe that this is going to come to a lot of companies from uh, ways that they weren't anticipating. Your financial auditors are going to start using this standard to hold your business accountable. Your insurance companies are going to start using this standard to set your rates. So if you aren't ready for it, it's going to find you. So, a couple things we're going to talk about, a uh, little background. And for this one, or this presentation, it's more about what we're doing at my company. Up to this point, a lot of presentations I've given is more about the background of ISO 55000 and why it's a good thing, the development of it. But this is really about my company and what we're doing and why we're doing it. So a little bit of background. My company is about 30 years old, Genzyme Corporation. And excuse my, uh, my, double, uh, my double clutch here. Um, because I don't like being at the podium. I like walking around and looking at you more at this level. Um, so. I'm, I have my presentation going here and the presentation going up there. So anyway, uh, my company, Genzyme, uh, 30 years old, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, biotech really. We focus on very rare diseases and our patients, if they don't have the stuff that they produce, um, a lot of our patients would die. So it's a very good industry to be in because you really see the value of, of uh, what you do. We don't just produce stuff, we produce, you know, memories, really, of people sticking around a lot longer than they would have. So, um, we had a network in our company. And it was a very informal network for a long time. We had plants in the US and primarily Western Europe. And we'd all get together and we used our maintenance management system as kind of our common ground or our touch point. But over time, our company was growing very fast. Um, so fast that we were running out of capacity. We couldn't produce enough product 
to serve our customers. Um, and along with that, we we're growing so fast that a lot of our regulatory um, efforts or uh, oversight changed over time and we weren't able to keep up to it. So 2008 was really an inflection point for our company where we had to change the way we did things. Um, in 2008, we changed from a more informal network to a very formal network. And when I say a formal network, we actually got support from our vice president of engineering and our senior vice president of operations uh, saying, hey, the maintenance group is essential to our operations. You guys need to figure stuff out. So we were very lucky. When we formed our network, our formal network, we called it ACE, Asset Care Excellence. So we did that before we really got into ISO 55000, but it's a really good segue. We tried to set up our network to say, we don't know everything. We need input from a lot of other people. So some of the key areas is we have a steering team made up of the maintenance managers or the people responsible for maintenance in each of our sites. We have global engineering. We have task teams of practitioners within our organizations. But a couple of the key areas that we really wanted to exploit is internal networks and external networks. And when I say internal networks, when you look at maintenance, at least in our maintenance group, although we had touch points in operations, it was more personal touch point. It wasn't an organizational touch point. Maintenance was always an afterthought. Maintenance was looked at as a cost. It was a necessary evil. So we needed to start getting into more of the other internal networks because we thought we had a lot of good solutions. And then external networks, uh, believe it or not, the pharmaceutical industry is not the best in class in a lot of areas of maintenance. Um, we had a lot of money so we could correct problems as they occurred but we weren't necessarily the most proactive, so we really had to build our reliability over time. And there were a lot of other, other industries out there that we could go and learn from. So we really put a heavy emphasis on external networks, um, SMRP, AMP. Um, we, uh, there's a BPOG group. We have the chair of one of the SMRP SIGs for pharmaceuticals here. Um, but one of the other groups we got involved with was the ISO 55000 group. And I will say that without a doubt, because of the breadth of expertise, that that has been the key group uh, that we've used. So, as I alluded to, we were growing very fast. We uh, had some issues with production. We um, had some issues with regulatory compliance. And as a result, because we're a publicly traded company, our stock price took a dive. There's a lot of value in the company, but because of our mistakes, our internal mistakes, our stock price took a dive. And because of that, a much larger company, Sanofi, acquired us in 2011. And that was a shock. When you go from controlling your own destiny to all of a sudden answering to someone else, what's going to happen? The good thing is, is that Sanofi, as a, a group, has realized that maintenance is an important element. And a lot of the stuff that we were doing they were on board with. They had multiple networks within their divisions. And we got to meet them and start collaborating with them. And even though Sanofi was 10 times the size of Genzyme at the time, they recognized that our network was a model of how they wanted their networks to run. Because their networks 
were focused on metrics and costs. They weren't necessarily um, keyed into solving things. Solving things once. Solving things in a common way that we could all use. Um, so it was very heartening that they kept our group going and we went through and integrated with um, some of the other Santa Fe groups. So now we have truly a company-wide maintenance uh, network so we can all share. So why are these efforts important? Reliability in production gives you predictable supply. And again, for drugs that affect people's lives, that's pretty, pretty important. Uh, improve quality, less deviations, and deviations are really a pain in the butt, non-value added activity. Um, it's a necessary evil, but if you mess up something, you have to do a big investigation of why something messed up. And if we can avoid those, we can really concentrate on value added activities rather than saying, hey, we messed up. Improved environmental and, and safety compliance and uh, our, our good ratio, our 2% ratio of $100 million uh, line item supplying or uh, supporting uh, $5 billion in sales. And that's just for Genzyme. Santa Fe is actually much bigger. So that's why we wanted to start uh, doing something better. So, but what was the better? When we look at it, maintenance excellence was a great place to start. Maintenance excellence made the maintenance group really take an internal look and say, are we doing everything we can to support the company? Are we doing everything right? Are we going through and using the best practices in industry? And as we started answering those questions and really getting our, um, our act together, we started moving on to reliability excellence. And we went to reliability excellence. That started to change the perception of the maintenance group within the organization. So although it was keyed in from our management that this was an important thing, operations and, and other groups were like, yeah, OK, it's just maintenance. But then we started doing reliability, and all of a sudden operations started being able to use their equipment more in an effective manner. And we started getting more output from our, mate or from our asset base. All of a sudden, we went into more of an operational excellence. And when we went into operational excellence, we actually started to get a seat at the table. But something was still missing. Um, although we got the seat at the table, we realized that the table still wasn't big enough. You know, we couldn't put our finger on it uh, at the time, but it was just something's missing. And then we ran into past 55. We started doing research on maintenance management systems and we came across PASS 55, which is more of an asset management system. So when we look at it, physical assets, hey, that's right in our wheelhouse. That's what we do. Large infrastructure, eh, OK, well, we have a lot of plants. But is it really, are we really talking apples to apples? Long-term long -term strategic plan. OK, well, it's important, but what's long-term? When you look at PASS 55 and you look at how people are using it, it's really heavy infrastructure. You know, rail, pipelines, electrical utilities, I mean, large infrastructure. Did, can we really use this? Um, and the other thing, and you know, Reese alluded to it, this was a, a British standard or a, a publicly available specification. So even if we wanted to use it, 
And believe it or not, Americans like stuff that was created in America. Even though it's a good idea somewhere else, you know, we, we want to be the masters of our domain. So could we make this work? And as we were going through and asking that question, all of a sudden ISO 55000 started coming up on the table. Oh, we're, we're going to try to shift past 55 to an ISO 55 or an ISO standard. So what does that mean? Okay, a lot of the same stuff in past 55, which is great, um, because past 55 had a lot of good stuff in it. But again, we couldn't really align it exactly with what we were doing. But ISO 55000 started broadening this, covers all assets, not just physical assets. Because in our group, we also had touch points in the IT organization. IT organization had their own system to track licenses. And licenses in a large company is a huge issue. Lots of dollars in computer licenses. Not just for your Windows and you know, using PowerPoint and Microsoft Project, but how about all the other specialty applications that you're using at your business, for your business? All of a sudden, that starts adding up because you're um, going through and writing a check every year for maintenance support for these computer systems. The other thing with ISO 55000 coming out of the gate was scalable to all organizations. So it wasn't just keyed in on big infrastructure. Um, and we had a lot of conversations, and it was actually kind of fun. We used Terry as a uh, kind of a guide point. It's like, OK, Terry, with your 10-man show, could you implement ISO 55000? And if he said yes, we knew we were on the right track. So ISO 55000, we can make this work. Then comes the reality. OK, ISO 55000 is great. A lot of the stuff in there is great. Builds on past 55 good ideas. But how are we going to get it implemented in our company? And that was the you know, $10 million question. Because you, you could go through and justify it a whole different bunch of ways. But how are you going to get acceptance? How are you going to get rollout in your organization? First thing is, we realize that going into this, ISO 55000 is really a roadmap for us for change management. And again, I'm talking about us. I don't want to talk about any other organization. We looked at this as change management. It's not a technical specification. When people look at ISO 55000, initially they're looking for KPIs and you know, the game plan and the template, how can I roll this out? Because at least the people in this community and the liability engineers, you know, we're engineers. You know, it's here's the problem, give me the solution, and I can roll out the solution. This isn't a solution. It's all about change management. And if you look at ISO 55000 and the title of ISO 55000, it's a management system for asset management. Big difference between an asset management or asset management on the technical level. The other uh, roadblock that we ran up into is that even though we had done a lot of good things in maintenance, people still looked at maintenance as a cost. How are you going to lower your maintenance costs? Yes, you're doing reliability excellence. How much is that costing me? Your maintenance budget needs to come down 2% next year. Where did the 2% come down from? Well, it came up from the finance guys. You need to cut 2%. So we realized pretty quickly that this isn't you know, a, a, a solution, or this is a solution, but we have to start changing the, our conversation. And when we start changing the conversation, 
we have to start changing it from this isn't about cost, this is about value. And if you look at the, uh, our new definition of assets, an item, entity, thing, or entity to, uh, uh, that has potential or actual value to an organization, um, you can see where uh, ISO 55000 is going. So with that in mind, where do we start? First thing is, and this is going to SMRP a couple months ago and talking to a lot of our peers, is when they think ISO 55000, they think it's maintenance excellence on steroids. This is about maintenance. We know everything about assets. So this is about us. This isn't about maintenance. This isn't about reliability. This is about value creation to your organization. And if you haven't keyed in on what I've been talking about, at least in our organization, maintenance is about this much of the organization. If you talk to finance people about assets, they'll tell you all about assets from a financial perspective. They own all the assets in the company. Now if you go to their fixed asset register, you'll see that they have absolutely no clue about what you do because they have a bucket like an $80 million building, but it's not broken down to all the stuff in that building. Okay, But they own assets, they're asset managers. If you look at the operations group, hey, I use this stuff or these assets to produce my stuff. I own the assets. Well, they didn't put in the capital budget to purchase those assets. Those assets aren't covered on their expense budget. They're not maintaining the assets, making sure that it works. But they own assets too, at least in their opinion. So that, and that's just two examples of asset management or people in their perceptions and their viewpoints of asset ownership. We look at it as we work on the assets, we know how they run, um, we can fix it, we can program it, whatever. So obviously because we know more, we're asset owners or um, asset management is about us, it's not about us. Asset management is not maintenance management. And again, that's me preaching, sorry. That's the way we're viewed, in, or that's the way it's viewed in our company. The next thing we did, and we had a really, um, we were really ahead of the curve because of our involvement with it, but we started reading ISO 55000 because we had to, because I was a member of the TAG, so I needed to make sure that we understood everything that was going on. But in reading ISO 55000, it was really illuminating. Um, the three standards themselves are, are very different from each other, so reading them as a, uh, as a whole helps out tremendously. And again, I'm, I'm excited that it's going to be released here in January, so all the rest of you will have the same benefits that we've had in our company, uh, being a member of the TAG. ISO 55000 is an overview of the asset management standard. When we developed that, we developed that as a sales guide for people wanting to implement the asset management standard how to talk to their executives or your executives or my executives. What are the benefits of asset management and having a system for asset management? Very good read. The people who involved with the development of ISO 55000, um, I have to give them a lot of credit because they didn't have a template to go to. They had varying views on things. 
when you look at some of the uh, hurdles that they had to overcome, you know, should we have a diagram, shouldn't we have a diagram? Easy question, maybe in this group, in the committee, not so much. Um, but if, once you see it, you'll see that it has a lot of good stuff. ISO 55001, that's the guts, that's the implementation, that's the shalls. Read that, get familiar with it, because it all interrelates. It starts breaking down the silos. And when we looked at this from our vantage point um, at Genzyme, that was probably the key element of these documents, is breaking down the silos and having us start to look at things from a common uh, view or a common value chain rather than a silo. Another key thing about standards, and this, is, uh, this was kind of an epiphany when we started looking at it, a standard is a standard. A standard doesn't flow sequentially. A standard means that you have to go through and have each one of those line items addressed. So you can start at the bottom and work your way up, or start at the top, work your way down, or start in the middle and go both ways. Again, key element. When you look at it the way the standard is written, it flows sequentially from um, upper management and organizational context all the way to monitoring and measuring um, the effectiveness of the standard. Just because it's uh, put in sequentially doesn't mean we have to follow it sequentially. And because of that, you can see what you're doing now that aligns with the standards because all of us are doing some things well aligning to the standard. We may have our capital projects follow the standard. It breaks down things. We may have alignment with the uh, organization. We may be measuring things really well, but identifying what you're doing helps you actually implement the standard. And that's where we started. We said, okay, here's all the elements. Let's map it to what we're doing. So when we look at it, when we get to Section 8 in operations, we're really good at operations. We have change processes. Um, we're monitoring equipment. It goes down to Section 10. Um, we, we have a, a process for um, uh, CAPAs and continuous improvement. Yeah, we're, we're pretty good at Sections 8 and 9 and 10. But let's look at section seven. Do we have all those elements? Okay, we have some of those elements. That's great. So by going through and saying, okay, here's the standard and this is what we're doing, now you have a roadmap of where to plug the holes. This is the fun one. Maintenance and reliability people have to start changing your language from the technical piece to the financial piece. Regardless of you want to or not, it's almost like everybody in the world, the language of business is English because most people talk about English or speak in English or um, translate things into English. That has to be the frame of reference of what you're doing now because everybody talks about money. No one wants to talk about maintenance. We found that out the hard way. Hey, our maintenance program is great. Okay, how much did you save me? Hey, we want to do this. It's going to be a really good idea. How much is it going to cost me? It doesn't matter. It matters, actually it matters quite a bit, but people don't know it matters quite a bit. They see it as a line item on a ledger. So if we can prove or we can start translating what we're doing into the finance piece, we can start changing the conversation. 
And again, that's what we've started to do at our company, and we've started to have success with this. We have the cost piece, but what value is that cost bringing us? When we go through and we have a maintenance history on a piece of equipment, okay, it costs us this much to maintain. Okay, it costs us this much to maintain, but your uptime went up this much. So now the output went up this much, and because of that, we were able to sell this much more. Okay? It's hard. It's really hard. Changing, you know, a, a maintenance guy's perspective or a maintenance management perspective from the technical into the financial isn't easy. But we've started to see success. And because of that, we've started to gain traction within our community saying, okay, what other things can we use? What other things can we translate? Because once we start translating and talk to people about the value piece, um, we've, we've gained traction. What's your organizational values? How can asset management go through and help the values of your organization? And the values of your organization may be that you want to be the most environmentally friendly, you want to be the best in class, or you want to make sure you help that sick person or that sick baby so those parents won't have to suffer seeing that little baby die. So it's not always about cost. And if you can say, yes, my assets are doing this, and this is the value it's creating for our company, and align that. You know, again, an element of Pass 55, alignment. Align what you're doing to your organizational values. I'm doing this to help us do that. All of a sudden, the conversation changes. And again, we were able to do this. We're still doing it. And it's really effective. Start getting to know others in your organization. They're really smart people in what they do. They just do things in a different way. They're experts in their areas, just like we're experts in maintenance and reliability. The finance people are, you know, believe it or not, they're a fun group. They are. And I tell you what, you, you take them out to lunch and have a lunch with them and start building a relationship with them, start talking about what you're doing, start figuring out what they need and start providing that need to them without them asking, boy, that goes a long way. Relationship building is huge in this effort. It isn't about maintenance. Asset management isn't maintenance management. It's about everything else. Creating the relationships is crucial, again, to get that traction. You start working with the finance people one-on-one, -on -one, you can't imagine the amount of doors and opportunities that opens up to the maintenance community. Start talking about finance. Talk to the finance people. They're really good guys. Here, here's a good one because this comes and goes. In 2008, we had our Senior Vice President of Engineering on board. We had our Senior Vice President of Operations on board. Go guys, go do something good. And then in 2011, when we got acquired, all of a sudden we didn't have the same Vice President of Engineering or the Senior Vice President of Operations, and we had to start all over again. So, 
except that you will probably not have an advocate through this for the whole duration of implementing ISO 55000 because it isn't an overnight thing. Our project map has us five years out to uh, finish what we started three or four years ago because it's a change in culture. It's not the, the next big thing. If you want to do this correctly, it's going to take a long time. It takes a lot of effort. It's not going to be quick. You're going to have roadblocks because every time someone comes in, someone new comes in, you start ha have to educate them or you have to start educating them on all the stuff that you've been doing to make sure that they don't cut the next step. You know, in operations, you have people coming in and out. You're going to have to be a constant advocate. You know, but it's fun. You know, it, it makes you talk to people. And the more people you talk to and the more good ideas you have, it just helps you out uh, both personally and professionally. So our expectations with our company is that the more people know about it, the more traction we'll have. The more relationships we build within our company, the more silos are going to start going away. We're all going to start going and hoeing in the same direction. But that's going to be good because questions are going to be asked. Questions that aren't being asked now are going to start being asked in the future. The conversation between cost and value we expect will always come up and we have to be prepared for it. Aligning with st stakeholder expectations. Well, you know, stakeholders are a lot of people. It could be the people you're producing for, in our case, a very sick person. It could be a regulator. In our case, it's just about every country in the world. Um, it could be your boss. It could be an operator. It could be the neighbor to your plant. There's a lot of stakeholders that people don't think of when they're doing their job on a regular basis, but this standard is very good at making you identify those stakeholder concerns. And it, again, going from Reese's presentation this morning, key things, alignment, stakeholder expectations, finance. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't go through and see each other's presentation beforehand, but you can see that all the stuff that we've had to do to get our program off the ground is all the things that he talked about. And it's important. But why? We believe that this is a necessary thing to do because we're getting squeezed from all sides. We're getting squeezed from our stakeholders, our shareholders, our management, you know, and everybody is, you know, it's, it's a, something that everybody in this room I know is dealing with. You know, keep doing what you're doing, but lower the cost. We're getting squeezed. But when we look at it, when we looked at this three years ago, starting to implement a, a PASS 55 slash ISO 55000, from uh, our perspective, we wanted to give our company a competitive advantage over all the other companies out there. If we could control our destiny, we wouldn't be in the situation that we were in 2008. If we can control our destiny and all our, or, or our entire organization is going in the same direction, that brings efficiencies in, that enables us to be more nimble in being able to change things. It can also do things like 10 years out when we look at 
um, recapitalization. Maybe we smooth that out, have our capital go down, and not have a spike in expenses. How big is that to your company? For us, we thought it was very big because especially with uh, being part of Santa Fe, you know, when you have a product that goes off patent, your income on that product drops about 90%, but you still have a whole lot of overhead that's sitting there. And what are you going to do with that overhead now that the, uh, the cost just went down or your potential profit went down by 90%? So recapitalization strategy, huge, huge in our industry. But we have knowledgeable people. We want to make a difference, and for our group anyway. And I, I apologize that my colleague Rob Chrisman couldn't be here because he's just as passionate about all this stuff as I am. We're ready for this challenge. So thanks for listening to me. Put a hand for Scott. <laughs> Excellent. That's fantastic. I guess the one comment I'll have, and I'll turn it over for questions, is that um, Scott was able to make this journey. The reason why he's an early adopter for ISO 55000, he's driving his company, him and his partner Rob are driving their company, is because they got involved contributing to the U.S. tag that wrote the standard. So in other words, he didn't go there for training. It wasn't a training course. It wasn't to learn. But he, by contributing, he was able to take that thought leadership away and bring that back to his organization. And I think it's a big lesson for all of us is to get involved with the groups that are contributing to the expansion of asset management practice and how possibly reliability and maintenance practices can support that in other areas. Finance contribute, and by contributing, you get. And look at what he's done with that. One more hand for Scott, please. You know how we're doing for time.